thanks uh, from Bangalore and many thanks to the organizers for uh, having me here. And uh, let's go ahead into this. So these greetings come from Bangalore. This is where I work. This is the Ramaya Medical College. And uh, that's one of the hospitals, the Ramaya Memorial Hospital, which is attached to it. It's the corporate kind of a setup on the same campus. And on this side, we have the Medical College Hospital. So on one campus, we have everything. So we have a college, we have a corporate, as well as a teaching hospital. So I would like to acknowledge a lot of people here. And uh, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Mahesh Soni, who's from Ankleshwar. He's given me a case to show during this. Dr. Ananya and uh, Dr. Shekhar, who are my colleagues from Bangalore, who also contributed with a case for, for this particular talk. So that's how we thought I'll uh, overview it. Uh, a little bit of a review. First, we see what is with regard to the mid tarsal neck fractures. What is it that we need to concentrate upon? What are the options of treatment that we have for this? How do we go about executing this particular thing? And what are the complications that would be there if we treat it, if we don't treat it, and how to overcome them? So one of the reviews, which is very recent, it has come as uh, late as 2020. And uh, in this, they have reviewed all the metatarsal fractures, all of them, including the base, the shaft, as well as the neck. And uh, they say that the central metatarsal fractures, that's the second, third, and fourth, are the ones which uh, are uh, associated with less than about 63% uh, of the injuries, per se, of the metatarsals. And uh, the central metatarsal neck fractures, are uh, the ones which are actually, which displace. The diaphyseal fractures tend not to displace because they are enclosed in a very nice, tight, soft tissue envelope. And it's the neck which doesn't have that much of an envelope. And due to the actions of the flexor tendons which are passing underneath it, it is going to displace. And predominantly the displacement is plantar words. And uh, it is going to be a major problem for us when we are managing and if we don't go ahead and do anything. So this is the parabola which they were just discussing about. This is called the Lelevris parabola. And you can see here that the first metatarsal is kind of uh, at the back. Second metatarsal is the longest of the two, of all the metatarsals, and it is slightly in front. And then we have the third, fourth, and fifth following a smooth curve, like a smooth parabola. And if you're looking at this in a coronal section, you can see that the first metatarsal is not actually bearing the weight, the base of the, uh, the head of the first metatarsal, it's the sesamoids which are taking the weight, and they take almost about 50% of the weight, and the other metatarsals between them are going to take about between 10 and 15% of the weight. So that's how it is going to be. So whenever we aim for a treatment of the neck fractures, we make sure that we have got this correctly. So why should we treat these fractures? because I told you that the plantar dislocation of the distal fragment, it leads to overload stresses, and this can lead to unmanageable plantar keratosis. Now, you might have seen some patients in your clinics who probably had an injury in the past. They would have even forgotten the injury because it became painless over a period of time. The fractures united, but they united in a plantar situation. So then they will come, they would have gone to somebody, they would have gone to a podiatrist, they would have gone to a general surgeon who would have said that there's a corn there, let me remove that corn for you. And uh, I'm sure all of you would have encountered patients like this. And if you just take a standing x-ray of them, you will be able to know that it was the metatarsal which is causing the issue and you can always correct it by means of a small osteotomy and fixing it with a plate. So what are the common mechanisms of injury for this? It's either it's a very small uh, height, it's fall from a standing height that you're going to have this, and it can be due to a twisting of a stationary foot itself. So that's when the patients will have these injuries. Options that we have for treatment. <clears throat> conservative treatment, do we have a role? Yes, we do have a role. And these are the clear indications for conservative treatment. The angulation should be less than 10 degrees in both the planes, both the AP as well as the oblique plane and the displacement should be less than three to four mm. So only when these two criteria are met, you can plan for a conservative treatment, which would involve maybe a slab application till the time the pain is relieved, then go on to a cam boot or something of that sort, and uh, that would be the conservative line of treatment. But if it doesn't fit into any of these, we should be planning for an operative treatment. And uh, what would that operative treatment involve? It would involve simple things. Maybe we could go ahead with fixing with K-wires, and KYS could be introduced either anterograde or it could go retrograde or a combination of the two. So this is the combination is what most people generally do. They go, retro, they go anterograde from the fracture side, go out plantar from the metatarsal head, 
and then reduce the fracture and go back in. So that's a retro ant retrograde kind of a fixation, which is what most people do. And uh, that is what has been done in most cases. This is what I borrowed from the textbook itself. You can see these metatarsal fractures, which have been fixed by means of K wires, which have been, pla which have been passed retrograde. And on the right-hand side, you can see something which has been uh, fixed with uh, absorbable pins or absorbable K wires. So you are not able to see the fixation there on that side at all. And once they are removed after, say, uh, three months or six weeks or whenever that it's convenient, you feel that the fracture is sufficient enough to take weight, then you can follow them up and see. This was one case uh, wherein there's a combination injury. There's a list frank. This actually did not happen because of a fall. It was an object falling onto him, and this was an open injury. So you, you might see the list frank being fixed only with K wires because there was no soft tissue here in this place to fix it rigidly. So that's the injury, list franks with the metatarsal neck fractures. And uh, metatarsal neck fractures were fixed by means of a retrograde fixation. And uh, that's the picture that was there. And after a period of time, we removed those K wires also, and he went on to heal. Now, uh, another metatarsal neck fractures. Again, uh, you can see a series of them, then uh, all reduced with a uh, retrograde kind of a wire itself. Now, this is one technique which uh, Pradeep said we could be focusing on. This is called the metazoos technique. This is there very common. It's described in pediatric fractures. Wherever you don't want to damage the physis is wherein you go from a point distal to it, and you continue with the met uh, along the uh, medullary, and you go and fix the metatarsal neck. This is also there in the case of the hand, hand metacarpals. We call it as a bouquet technique. We use the same principle in those cases also. It's like a three-point fixation that we are going to achieve and passing the K wire from the distal end without actually opening up near the region of the fracture itself. So this can be done in these metatarsal neck fractures. This is the position which you can utilize on the table. So when you have fixed the table, uh, when you can position him, so one limb is out of the way, the other limb is fixed, and uh, you are able to actually get a good reduction and good view on both the AP as well as the lateral view. You can see that the CM can move very well, and you don't have to worry about any assistance being there with you. That's the way the foot is positioned, and uh, that's the K wire which is being uh, uh, prepared from the uh, base, and that's the K wire which has been passed inside, and uh, once it has been passed, you can bend it over, use something to bend that wire and cut it flush, or you can even just bury it underneath the skin and remove it after a period of maybe three months or six months or even a year, once you feel you are very comfortable with having the uh, fracture has been united in those cases. So if you bury them inside, you don't have to worry about the irritation also, and you can take them out after a period of a year or so. So that's the incisions which will remain in these cases, and uh, you can see that it's a very minimal invasive kind of a fixation, and you're able to correct your uh, fractures very well. That's how it corrects itself. Another case example, so done in sometime in October, that's the displacements. Also there was a small uh, list frank which was very minor list franks, was just immobilized with uh, K wire initially, went on to heal over a period of months and uh, the most recent X-ray was found that uh, the fractures has united. And uh, this, the wires would be removed after a period of time. So what complications I just mentioned to you in the beginning itself, it's a plantar displaced one, then you can have a worse outcome. There would be painful callosities, metatarsalgia, parabola is disrupted. That again leads to a lot of other complications and neuroma formations can be there whenever there's a uh, fracture which is maluniting. These complications are dorsally displaced, it's a soft tissue. Plantar displaced, it's going to involve the, uh, uh, the uh, plantar aspect of the foot. And uh, in a transverse plane, these are better tolerated, even if it is there. One similar example of mine, wherein this dorsally displaced, Ideal recommendation is to go in with an AO kind of a plate where you perform a neck osteotomy and you realign the fracture fragments and fix them by means of plates which are available like this. This is taken from the AO surgery reference. And uh, we can fix them. In the absence of that, we can go in with simpler plates also, some imitations or sometimes even dental plates, you can use them, which is what I've used. This is a metatarsal which I have fixed with this. and. Uh, and uh, I have even used a 130 blur plate on an occasion. So it was looking a little big and thick in this particular patient. Okay, and K wires for the lateral sides. So that's about it. So in summarizing the whole thing, the neck uh, metatarsal fractures are considered with regard to the central metatarsal fractures. Surgical management, in the case of displacements, I already told you the limits that we can accept. 
antro or retrograde fixation can be utilized. In certain instances, we can use a plate and uh, complications to be awarded. Thank you so much. You can I'll continue with your second talk. I'll continue with the second yeah. talk also. So this was uh, something which uh, Pradeep told me all of a sudden that uh, Balvinder is not coming, can you take this? Then this is more theory, it doesn't have too many cases in it. I have borrowed most of the pictures from the net or from the books and I definitely would like to acknowledge them. And uh, should we fix all the fifth metatarsal fractures? This is something which is being thought of. I think if you look up for fifth metatarsal fractures, if you do an internet search, you will find fixation being mentioned almost very often. And uh, if you are already enrolled onto UVMD and all, I think every third day or something, you will probably find a video which has come up which involves the fixation of the fifth metatarsal in the elite at least or something of that sort. So what's very important about the fifth metatarsal? It's the blood supply itself. So because the blood supply to the fifth metatarsal is quite unique, and uh, which is the reason you need to know the fracture zones and the classification and how you need to manage them. Uh, that's how the blood supply to the fifth metatarsal is. It's from the lateral perineal artery. You're going to get that small branch, which is the nutrient vessel, which is coming from distal to proximal in this case. And uh, you do have metaphyseal arteries which are coming from the proximal to the distal. And there's an area of bone which is almost like a watershed. And it's fractures in this level, because they have a very little blood supply, are the ones which are notorious for a non-union and also for complications. So which is the reason that definitely would warrant an internal fixation. So no brainer at all. So that's how it is. There are three zones which were described. They were described by uh, uh, the uh, this thing. Uh, so the, the metaphyseal artery is there, avascular zone, and the nutrient artery, which is there. And these are the break, if it is going to happen, how you're going to deal with it. So that's the Dameron quill classification, which I was just trying to recollect. So the zone one fractures are the uh, fractures which can be managed very well conservatively. They are also called as avulsion fractures. They don't, they're, though they are not strictly avulsions of anything, they're called as avulsion fractures because they are involving that small fragment of the bone itself, of the base of the metatarsal. Then we have the zone two fractures, which are the true Jones fractures, which are not going to extend into the intermetatarsal articulation. So that's by definition a Jones fracture which is not entering into the intermetatarsal articulation between the fourth and fifth, and it is limited only to the cubometatarsal articulation. So that's a Jones fracture. And the stress, and the zone three is going to be a, a fracture which can either be a stress fracture or it could be simply treated as a diaphyseal fracture. So uh, our almost two thirds of these sports injuries, uh, it's going to be soccer, which is, uh, because that's the thing where you are uh, most uh, on the feet, running around, and uh, that's where you're going to have the fractures. Avulsion fractures, which I told you, are uh, due to a sudden inversion of the foot. That's a typical trauma that mechanism that's been mentioned. And it accompanies generally uh, less dislocation of the fragments. You don't see too much of displacement in these fragments. And these patients sometimes might not even know that they had a fracture. They might come to you for something else, and you might detect that they had a fracture in, sometime in the past. And uh, that's how the avulsion fracture is with relation to the peroneus brevis. It's not always, again, a picture from the AO surgery reference. It's not always involving the tip of the peroneus brevis or to the ligaments which are there. It could just be a small tip avulsion. The surgical indications for this are very few, and uh, this would never be there. You would never have this. This would be extrapolated more for the Jones fracture that you have these same surgical in, uh, uh, indications. An acute Jones fracture caused again by an adduction of the forefoot. That one was an inversion injury, the, the tip one. This is more of an adduction kind of injury. The whole of the forefoot is going in for an adduction. So the lateral borders is going to be stressed out more and cause the fracture. So you will find the fractures also running in the similar direction only. And uh, in contrast to the acute, the chronic Jones fracture is a stress fracture, which is there uh, in, and uh, which is actually a little notorious when it comes to the non-unions. It has got a very poor hearing fit, uh, healing potential. There's a classification of TOGS, which is quite useful with, if you're planning for the management of these surgically. In a type one, it's just a narrow fracture. There is uh, no intramedullary sclerosis, which would mean that there's all, not a non-union. And in the type two, there's a widening of the fracture line, and there is some intramedullary sclerosis, would mean that it's already going in for some signs of a non-union. You might need 
In addition to fixation, you might need something biological in these cases. And in the type 3, it's a complete non-union, where this uh, medullary canal is completely obliterated. So fixation with maybe BMAC, fixation with bone graft plus BMAC. So that would how the plan would go on. Conservative treatment in initial stages, yes, we can plan. So, so patients who don't have that much of a activity, who are not athletes, who are not going to get back to a running sport, maybe we can just go ahead with a uh, conservative approach in them. We can give them initially a plaster cast for two weeks to three weeks, then give them a uh, walking boot, and they'll be quite comfortable with that. And once they are pain-free, we can take that off. The rates of non-unions and refractures in these is quite high, and uh, we need to watch out for this. We need to follow these patients up quite well. That's the standard fixation which has been accepted. That's the screw which has been passed from the distal to the proximal intramedullary, and which is having a differential pitch generally so that it compresses at the fracture site. That's the accepted treatment, but there are other methods of treat treatment which have been mentioned. One of them is a planter plate which is available. It's available in the West. We have not used it here, but there's also a hook plate which is available which can be used to fix it. So these fractures, and sometimes if there's too much of a comminution, if you're not able to put either a screw or a plate, then you can go ahead with something like a tension band wiring. This also is an accepted modality of treatment. So intramedial screw fixation. This isn't a joint. It's a comminution, sir. It's a base fifth metatarsal with a comminution. So... So this is not extending into the, it's it's extending into the cubometatarsal cubometatarsal articulation, but not extending into the intermetatarsal articulations. That's what was told, and it's a picture which I have taken from the net. I told you. Yeah, I, I just borrowed some that pictures. This need not be so can I just complete? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. So intermedial screw fixation is the one which is uh, used and uh, combined with the use of orthobiologics. The way I told you. Either it is a BMAC or we go in with a bone graft plus a BMAC. And uh, the standard, the, thing, the indications again remain the same, more than 2 mm of a displacement or a non-union. So that's the standard way of treatment. You can fix it by means of a screw. The rehabilitation and back to sports, the risk of refracture would be there. Uh, after conservative treatment, we need to watch out for this. And uh, conservative treatment takes at least twice the time to return back to sports as compared to surgical treatment. There's a paper which has come. This is a meta-analysis of all the fractures of the fifth metatarsal, mm -hmm. and uh, this is actually has come from China, and it is uh, studying more than 400 patients. And uh, they have put up all these uh, papers that they have studied, what are the records that they had screened, and all that, and including the uh, forest curves that they have mentioned. So all the displays, and uh, all of them put together, we could infer from them that a large significant reduction in not only the duration of return to activity or uh, return to sport or uh, even daily uh, activities is much better with an operatively managed fracture. And uh, these findings therefore signify the importance of an operative intervention, especially in the zone two kind of a fracture and not in any other fractures. And uh, the drawback is that they have, the studies that they have, the metatarsal fractures, the levels have not been mentioned is what they have said and which was a drawback, but then we know that it's essentially the zone two which, are, which we have been fixing for long. And uh, these could very well be inferred. That is, with surgical intervention, we could probably get an earlier return to activity. Thank you so much.